and there are very few scholars I know working in the field about whom you can say this. Uh, so this book, uh, Nets of uh, Awareness, uh, you know, this is a sort of a pivotal work of Urdu literary criticism. And if you are interested in what's going, what was going on in 19th century India and how Urdu as a language was developing, how the sort of Urdu was speaking about itself, I mean, you have to sort of refer to this book. So that uh, is very important. Then she has, you know, other books, uh, this lovely book uh, called uh, Marvelous Encounters, and this is about the, you know, the what she calls the folk romance tradition, uh, which is uh, also very uh, good and interesting. And then uh, she has uh, translated most of uh, Abe Hayat, uh, which is uh, the canonical work of uh, Urdu literature from 19th century, one could say, a sort of history of Urdu uh, language and literature uh, with uh, Shamsur Rahman Farukhi. So um, again, this is something that uh, you know uh, you can use. Uh, and <coughs> if you are studying the Ghazal tradition or the poetry tradition, then of course you need to know the uh, rule for its meter and poetics. And uh, one of the books that I find very helpful in studying that is this book she did uh, on Urdu meter with uh, Khalid Saha. So um, it, uh, it's, uh, Fran's role in the study of uh, Urdu literature has been very important. Uh, and uh, now the most exciting project that uh, she has undertaken is a project by the name of Desert Full of Roses. And uh, here she's providing a commentary for uh, Ghalib's uh, ghazals. She doesn't want to call it a translation because she doesn't really believe that one could uh, do justice uh, uh, in uh, translating Ghalib, but this is something that's available to all of us uh, who have the ability to log on, uh, and uh, this is something I highly recommend you go and uh, read. And again, it's the best commentary of Ghalib that's available to us. Uh, so uh, uh, it's with uh, great pleasure that I uh, introduce uh, Fan Pritchett. And, uh, you know, thank you again for being here. Well, it's lovely to be here, and I know Upper is inviting everybody he knows in sequence, so I'm pleased to be part of the, I'm pleased to be part of the sequence. And it's, it's a kind of a comfortable experience to be here, which in a room that's so full of old friends and also new friends whom I've heard a lot about. Some of the students here I've been given capsule biographies of and told how good they are. I've heard a lot about the flagship program and it's been a great chance to catch up on some old friends and, and spend time with people I've known for many years. Uh, of course that's the advantage of being in a field for a long time. You know everybody at any university for many years and you all see each other and have gossip to share. Um, I can't believe that I had the hubris to give a, a talk with a title like How to Read Ghalib. I mean I just have never done it before and I can't imagine the gall to do it. But the only thing I can say in my defense is that if there's such a thing as sweat equity when it comes to Urdu poetry, I have sweat equity. Um, in Ghalib's lifetime, he chose to publish 1,459 Urdu shares, and I have now commented online on all of the 1,459. That's the work of seven or eight years, and it's been, it's been quite a fantastic experience, and somehow this is the time when I feel like talking about it in a bit of a summing up way, uh, because I just finished it last fall. I finished the first go-round, and now I'm starting the second go-round and revising and improving my commentary and also adding in some of the best of Ghalib's unpublished shares as well. So the, the parade goes on and it's a work in progress and it's part of the pleasure of the internet that unlike a book, whereas for example in Nets of Awareness in the glossary there's one mistake that I've, I've been sorry about all those years. I misdefined the word Zameen in the glossary. Oh. And every time I look at the book, I think with sorrow of all the many people who've got a wrong notion about the word Zameen from here. But on the internet, you can fix it instantly. So it's very refreshing. 
So there are many things it's, it would be delightful to talk about in the way of Ghalib because he really kind of looms over Urdu literature in a very protean way. For us, for us Western types, he looms larger than Mir. Um, for people in the tradition, uh, Mir looms very large, and a few other people loom very large too, and Ghalib is sometimes thought to be sort of the pyrotechnics guy um, <laughs> that people love who are not Ahle Zabans because what he does is frequently distort grammar and distort usage and distort the idiom of the Mohavra of the language. And so that we, we foreigners who are not so integrally wedded to the usages and the idioms of the language, we appreciate the flashiness, whereas real or duwalas would appreciate the subtleties of the daily language, <laughs> the rosemarra kisaban and all that. Be that as it may, um, Ghalib has stood up very well over the years. And people love him today, even when they don't understand his poetry very well, even when they don't have the vocabulary to talk about him very well. He's far more translated than Mir. He's, he's far more talked about. He's very exciting to people, even though he's had a sort of uh, mixed experience in terms of his critical reception. So that's really what I'd like to talk about today, some of the ways that people have tried to interpret the poetry of Ghalib and the way that I've tried to do it myself. Um, <coughs> You could think that there is a ready-made interpretive tradition in the form of the rhetorical handbooks of Persian and Urdu that are filled with classifications. You know, all the different kinds of izafats, um, all the different kinds of figures of speech, um, all of the ways you can put together khabariya and inshaiya and so forth, categories like that. On the whole, however, they aren't very helpful. Um, we have the same handbooks of, of literary terminology and rhetoric in English. And maybe uh, many of us have the Princeton Handbook of Poetry and Poetics sitting around. And we know what terms like synecdoche and metonymy and, and anacolithon mean. But how helpful is that really in appreciating poetry? I mean, most of the time, pointing to examples of those devices doesn't really get you very far in explaining or enjoying poetry. We have Ghalib's own letters. Um, there are something like 14 instances in his letters, by my count, in which um, he explains, more or less, the meaning of one of his verses to a particular inquirer who has asked a particular question, not in any global or abstract or theoretical way. Needless to say, all 14 are on my website. So um, they are not what we could wish. We know that he constantly wrote um, corrections to his ustads. They would send him their verses, and he would actually go through and quickly mark changes, just the way a teacher can grade exercises. This is part of the nature of the technical training of the ustad and the shagird relationship in the guzzle. We don't have the, any survivals of those corrections that he made. We know that he had friends whose literary ability as Guzzle poets he greatly respected, or at least he said in his letters that he greatly respected. Um, and presumably when they got together, they must have talked about Urdu poetry, but we have no record of those conversations. So we really don't have good access to Ghalib's own poetics, whatever they may have been. There's a few famous sentences here and there. Um, he writes to one friend, Abhai uh, Shairi, Mani afrini hai qafiya pemai nahi. Uh, poetry is the creation of meaning, it's not the measuring out of rhyme. But, you know, how far does that take us either? <laughs> so we don't have as much as we would like. What we have is over a hundred commentaries um, running through the century and several decades since um, Ghalib's death. That's an astonishing number, and you would think they would be of great value and help. I'm now the 101st or whatever, but <laughs> so I'm joining the tradition, so I'm entitled to discuss it. I put uh, samples from various ones of them um, on my website as part of my own commentarial work. Basically, it's fair to say that the approach of the commentators is um, one verse, one prose paraphrase, and then on to the next verse. This is basically what they do. There are exceptions and all, but this is basically what they do. It's helpful in a way. It's better. If you can't understand a verse at all, it's much better than nothing. But it never explains why a verse is excellent or interesting or exciting. Um, a prose paraphrase can only do so much. In a general way, you also have the attempts of certain natural shairi writers to make Ghalib's poetry reflect his life. You know, to try to find references to his alleged 
fair, cruel old domini, Bertisitam Pesha domini that he loved in his youth. And they try to pick out little bits of his poetry here and there that might reflect circumstances of his life. For a lot of reasons, this is very difficult to do, and only in a very few cases can it actually be done. But the attempt has been made for reasons that I write about in Nets of Awareness. People have greatly wished to feel that poetry is connected to the poet's life because they feel that's validating for the poetry. But of course, that's a disaster in the case of the guzzle because it's filled with, you know, uh, scandalous beloveds, um, un beautiful boys, courtesans, uh, God. It's ripping your clothes off and running into the desert and getting drunk and doing all sorts of things that the real life poets would never do that are literary tropes. So the biographical approach has been a disaster for um, the guzzle over the past century or more. Um, I'd like to give a special mention also to Anne-Marie Schimmel. She's written a book about Ghalib's fire imagery called Dance of Sparks. And also probably most of you know her work. Have people read Anne-Marie Schimmel? She has a wonderful approach and her erudition is fabulous. So she'll give you a verse of Ghalib's about sparks, then she'll say, oh, this reminds me of a verse of Molana Rumi's about sparks. This reminds me of one by Shah Abdul Latif. This reminds me of one by Mir Dard. And she'll actually bring it on back after several more verses and say, and this reminds me of another verse of Ghalib's about sparks. And so it goes on and on in a wonderful, unforced, enjoyable way, celebrating a beautiful tradition, but it doesn't get into the question of how does Ghalib do it? Why is his poetry more interesting and exciting than that of his contemporaries? We also have a vein of ideological con commentary. Um, some of the progressives, as Akbar knows and has well shown, um, claim Ghalib as a revolutionary or as a progressive or as their predecessor and that all sorts of, of politically powerful left-wing themes are to be found in his poetry so that he should be considered a sort of, of um, avant-garde progressive before his time. Um, we also have Ralph Russell, of course, who argues that the value of the guzzle is to teach us humanism and tolerance and respect for all kinds of love and so forth. Um, Ralph Russell, too, is a communist, and he's doing this ideologically. And so, um, you know, it's, it's something that he just asserts, but it's impossible for him to find evidence for this view in the traditional tazkiras or in letters or in commentaries by any of the classical guzzle poets. This is just not how they discussed each other's verses ever. So it's not too helpful. As we move toward our own time, um, Nair Masood, who's best known as a brilliant, difficult, obscure, interesting modern short story writer, has also written a brief commentary on Ghalib. Uh, very elaborate, very complex, very interesting, only on a handful of verses. But I certainly enjoy his commentary and I want to pay tribute to him. And also to my own Ustad, um, C.M. Naim, who's written um, English language commentaries. Of the, the first English language commentator on a substantial number of Ghalib's guzzles is C.M. Naim. And he too has taken a kind of eclectic approach and he's been very helpful for the verses that he has discussed. Uh, both, of these, both of these gentlemen's commentaries are excerpted in my, on my website. Um, then, of course, you know what I'm getting to. Um, I have what I call the conceptual commentary by Shamsur Rahman Farooqi, whom I've worked with <coughs> closely in a number of projects over the years. Um, he has actually gone back and sort of recuperated some of the Tazkara terminology. Um, so that terms like mani afrini, the creation of meaning, mazmoon afrini, the creation of new themes for the classical ghazal, um, kaifiyat, or a quality of mood that sort of captivates you. Um, he's created several more of these terms as well. And indeed, they're very helpful when you read his criticism. They're very interesting. But I always have trouble using them effectively myself because I still want to know how Mani Afarini is done. How does Ghalib create multiple meanings in, in his poetry? What does it mean to say that he does? And I have a lot of trouble with Mazmoon Afarini because it means creating new Mazmoons or themes that have never been used before. But when you read a verse with a theme in it, how do you know if the theme is new? Well, obviously, if you're Shamsur Rahman, you just know because you've read a million shares and you just say, ah, this is a new one. But most of us who haven't, um, it's not something that's objectively apparent in the verse itself. So it's not easy to use as a critical term. 
So I kind of had to find my own way here, and I, begin, I began by having a lot of trouble. I really loved the ghazal effortlessly from the very first chair of Ghalib that I ever saw. Um, and at first I thought that the ghazal was a poem like the sonnet, and that I would enjoy translating it and working with it. And when I looked at, at um, translations of Ghalib, I never liked them. So I thought, aha, the world is waiting for me to do my translation. Just wait, I'll be so good. But over the years I found that I wasn't good. My translations were no good either. And I got more and more vexed by this because I just couldn't put things across. But I could teach Ghalib. And I could get my students to understand the poetry, to enjoy the poetry. How could this be? So eventually I realized that I needed more space. What you couldn't do in two lines, you could do in two paragraphs as far as making these verses come through. And then I said, aha, that's called a commentary, Fran. That's why people write commentaries on Ghalib. So I started preparing to write a commentary and somehow after September 11th, I was especially eager to put it online. Of course, you almost couldn't put things online before September 11th anyway because the technology, uh, the World Wide Web was just developing and Unicode was just developing and so you couldn't really put things online well until after that anyway. But I've had wonderful help and so I've been able to, to do it. So to my regret, as I moved along, I discovered that the guzzle is not like a sonnet. The guzzle as a poem basically doesn't exist. I'm not going to spend time talking about this now, but if you want to, we can discuss it later. That's my clear argument. As a poem, the guzzle does not exist. It's just a repository and collection device for individual shares. And when I first realized this, I was very disappointed because I thought, oh, a little two-line share? That's so minimal. What can you do in two lines? That's not long enough to be interesting. I have lost my great sonnet-like guzzle genre, and I've gained just a bunch of little, little skinny things to replace it. I've been cheated here. So I did the best I could, and I started looking, and indeed I found that these little two-line mini microcosmic worlds, minor little mini poems, were fantastically huge and fantastically rich when you use the right tools to look inside them. So I no longer regret the loss of the guzzle. So I have two sources of knowledge that really gave me the proper hints for dealing with this kind of poetry. And then I have two great principles to suggest to you, and then I'll proceed to illustrate them a bit. Um, so of course, this is just a, a very brief overview, and I'm comfortable with it. It's such a luxury because everything I'm going to say is worked out in much more detail on my website. So if I don't get a chance to use as many examples as I would like to, um, I'll be able to at least point you in that direction and you can find a great many more at your pleasure. So from the Tuskara tradition, I basically learned, the, the, the anthology tradition in Urdu literature, I basically learned that only the share counts and the guzzle does not count. And so from, I give credit to Tuskaras for making that point very clear. There are other ways to make it clear too, but Tuskaras make it inescapable. And I especially want to mention the Mushaira tradition. There is a certain quality of Mushaira performance that as far as we know goes back forever. And you'll recognize that even if all you've seen is, is Bollywood filmy Mushairas, or if you've been to any modern Mushairas, you'll know that invariably the poet recites the first line and then what does he do? He never goes on to recite the second line, does he? He stops and there's a big gap and the audience starts saying, kya hu, va va va, subhanallah, and maybe if they're feeling polite, they say, mukarrar, repeat it. And then he says the first line again, and he goes like this to accept all the praise, and some people in the audience are murmuring the first line again as though they were in ecstasy at it, because you know, <laughs> uh, it's part of, the, part of the culture that you're supposed to show great appreciation. And if there's a singer, you know, there, or if there's music, there's, there's an interval in there. And then he, gets, he gives you the first line again, <coughs> followed by the second line. So a <coughs> classical guzzle poet could always count on a considerable interval between the time <coughs> the audience got the first line and the time they got the second line. And this sets up a terrific poetics thing for the share. It means that you can do things with the first line involving obscurity, misdirection, ambiguity, incompleteness, excitingness, weirdness, and the audience will have to wait 
to have it resolved in the second line, if it's going to be resolved at all. And this is a huge piece of poetics that you can overlook if you just look at, you know, the divan. Because in the divan, you can just look ahead, and there's no suspense at all. But choral presentation in a mushaira, or for recitation by friends to each other, and the poetics of the first line versus the second line go very deep and are really important. Okay, um, let me let me give you my two macro principles and then a few illustrations here. My macro principle number one is if if you want to approach a share of Ghalib and you want to get something out of it and you don't know how, the best piece of general advice, the tactical advice I'd give you is ask yourself, what if this verse were paraphrased in <coughs> prose and put into nice normal grammar with all the missing words filled in and put in prose order, what would be lost? Compare it very carefully with the original and see what would be lost. Sometimes the answer is huge things would be lost. Sometimes the answer is very little would be lost, apparently. And my micro principle to match that is another way to go at verses if they're, if they're looking opaque to you. Um, the verse is right. They're 15 or 20 lines long, right? So, fi sorry, 15 or 20 words long. They're tiny. So you say to yourself, okay, what if someone told me reliably that the first word in this verse was the key word, the most important word? How might that be so? And then you try to find some way that the first word could really be doing something special that would be operative in some powerful way in the share. And then you try the second word, and then you try the third word. And you can try the whole 15 or so words very easily. And sometimes you'll focus your attention then on some word, and you'll suddenly say, oh yeah, this could have another meaning, or this could be read differently. And that will give you remarkable insights into the whole of the, of the um, possibilities of that share. So I would like to go ahead and give you a few examples in order of like increasing complexity of what happens when you apply these principles to Ghalib's poetry. And the best asset that I've had in doing this, it's not that I'm some extremely clever critic, it's that the best universe of discourse for any poet's work is the rest of that poet's work. I mean, there's plenty of other universes of discourse too, but you know that the rest of that poet's work is relevant, right? You certainly want to look at whatever the poet write has written in the light of whatever else he's written. And so I have, God knows, done that exhaustively and, and systematically, so that where there are patterns and trends and persistent tendencies, I've been able to find them. And now I've been able to document a lot of them online for you folks, so you can look at them yourself and check my work. So first of all, let me point out that there certainly are verses that simply say something, where the two lines work together and the point of the verse seems to be the content of it rather than the form. Some of these are verses of mood, but some of them are not. Here's a nice verse of mood. Hale dil nahi malum, lakin is qadar yani. See now, you really would like to go on, wouldn't you? Hale dil nahi malum, lakin is qadar yani. Hamne tumne. No, sorry. Humne baraha dhundha, tumne baraha baya. Right? Um, I don't know anything about the state of the heart, but only this much. Um, many times we lost it, many times you found it. Now, there's not much wordplay, there's not much complexity, there's not much doubt about what the verse means. Uh, it simply says something, and you're supposed to enjoy what it said. Kya hi rizvan se lardai hogi. How I will quarrel with Rizvan. Ghar tera khuld me ghar yadaya. If in paradise I remember your house. <laughs> There's something that's quite simple, but it's enjoyable. It's, it's got a, a piquancy, piquancy to it. Um, here's a rather complicated one, but it still has, I believe, that quality. Ha pare sarhade idraak se apna masjood. That which we worship is beyond the senses. Qibla ko ahle nazar qibla numa kahte hain. People of insight refer to the qibla as the qibla pointer or the qibla shower, which is really remarkable because after all the qibla is already a pointer. 
it, it points you toward Mecca so that you can do your prayers. So to call it, to call the Qibla, which is a pointer, a Qibla pointer, makes you immediately start thinking, what is it, a pointer of a pointer? Does it mean that God is twice as far away as we thought? And you go off in reflections, but the reflections are generated by you. The verse itself has simply made a very simple statement with no particular wordplay and no particular am ambiguity about it. Um, or the famous Imam Mujay Roke Hajjo Kinche Hamujay Kufra, right? Everybody's been bothered by that. Um, faith pulls me back and infidelity, Kufra, urges me onward. Then what? What's the second Misra? Kaaba mere piche hai, Kalisa mere age. The Kaaba is behind me, the church is in front of me. There's a simple flat statement. Um, what does it mean? No word play, no subtleties about it, and yet it's very piquant, you have to think about it. So that's, that's the simplest kind of use you can make of two lines, is to simply make a statement that's very interesting, that either the mood of it or the intellectual quality of it will engage your audience. Um, <coughs> the next step is a category that I call Mushaira verses. I invented this category, and I think of them as verses that are perfect for recitation in a Mushaira. And I'll just give you one example. Buegul nala edil do de charare mafil. Buegul, what does that mean? Smell of the rose. Nala edil. Cry of the heart. The lament of the heart. Do de charare mafil. Dude. The smoke of the lamp of the gathering. There's your first mystery. You don't mind if I treat this a little bit like a class, no, right? No, please do. Please I can't resist, yes. right? Because so many people know these things. Buegul nala edil du de charare mafil, right? Um, that's the first misra, and you don't see quite how these things go together, and you have to wait, of course, in Mushaira terms, right? And you have to wait and act, you know, polite and put up with the nakhre, the kana of the shire and all that sort of thing. <laughs> then what do you get? Does anybody know it? Jo teri bazam se nikla, so pareshan nikla. Whatever emerged from your gathering emerged now that has several nice Mushaira verse qualities all in one. The one nice quality is that even when you start the second line, you can't figure anything out. You have to wait till the last possible minute. Until you hear the word paresha, you don't get it at all. And suddenly, you get it totally, and you get the wittiness of it. Because paresha in Persian literally means disheveled. scattered and dispersed and disheveled. What does it mean metaphorically in Urdu? Anxious, agitated, distressed. So in the first line, what have we got? Two examples of things that are physically dispersed and agitated, the bue gul and the du de chirage mefil, and one, the nala edil, um, which could be said to go either way. It could be dispersing itself as a cry in the air, or it could be pareshan in a metaphorical Urdu way. So you at once appreciate what was going on in the first line in a way that you couldn't while it was happening. And then the final quality of a Mushaira verse is that when you've got it, you've got it. You have no desire to listen to this verse several times again or to think about it or to ponder over it. You know there's nothing more to be got from it than what we've already gotten, so you're ready to move on. That too makes it perfect for a Mushaira. Um, I'll just mention a couple more. I know that time is short, and you want me to finish up, so. more minutes, so. Is that really yes, okay? That's totally then I have time to give you the rest of my yes. brief little, little tour here, and then I will certainly stop and we can talk at more length. Okay, another very common form of, of the use of your, your little two lines um, is not so much to emphasize their separateness, A and B, and postpone the thrill until the end of B, but to do terrific wordplay. And here's where the certain basic commonalities of meaning come in very much. Um, what are the two meanings of dimag? What's the one that everybody knows? What's the one that very few people know? Nose. Nose. Oh, yes, good. Somebody knows it. My Ustad always pointed that out to me. Remember, dimag doesn't just mean mind, it means nose. And I used to think, why is this so important? But of course, now I understand. Mohabbat hi chaman se, lekin ab ye be hai. 
محبت تھی چمن سے لیکن اب یہ بے دماغی ہے کہ موج بو گل سے ناک میں آتا ہے دم میرا موج بو گل سے فرام اے ویو آف دا سینٹ آف دا روز ناک میں دم آتا ہے میرا لٹرلی دا بریتھ کمز ان ٹو مائی نوز بٹ واٹ از دیٹ مین میٹافورکلی I'm like on the verge of dying, idiomatically. I'm, I'm like ready to collapse. I now feel so much distaste. I'm so disaffected from the garden that when I smell the rose, um, I'm like ready to, you know, just forget about it. I'm like have an allergic reaction to it, is what the verse is actually purporting to say. But naturally, now in retrospect, we go back. And in the first Misra, we notice Be de Mari. And now we notice it doesn't just mean you know, disaffection in your mind, it means literally noselessness. And when we get the moje buwe gul, a wave of the scent of the rose, nak me damatahe, it not only just kills me or wipes me out, but it actually literally comes into my nose. So there's, there's a combination of two pleasures, the pleasure of what's being said, plus the pleasure of this verbal surface, how it's being said, all these little munasibats and affinities and word plays and ways that sort of fancify the verbal surface so that you could enjoy much more than just the content of the verse. You, you wouldn't enjoy it at all if it were paraphrased in other words. I have many more examples, but I won't take the um, time to illustrate them because word play verses are, are not hard to get. So, now here's another category. I have really, just a couple, It's hard to know. The more complicated we get, it's harder to figure out these categories, but that's part of Golub's charm. So the next category I want to propose is also my own invention um, as a practical matter, um, not a theoretical matter. I call them A comma B verses. And what they are is verses in which the two lines are presented and there isn't any obvious um, connection between the two, and so you have to make the connection between the two for yourself. So let me give you a simple example first. It's very beautiful. Tu orara ishe chame kakul. Tu orara ishe chame kakul. You and the adornment of curly tresses. You know, your the beloved has these infinitely long, dark, tangling curls. Tu orara ishe chame kakul. My or andeshahai dur daraz. I and long dark thoughts, or long far away thoughts, sorry, dur daraz, far away long thoughts. And andesha doesn't just mean neutral thought usually, right? It usually means something about suspicion or doubt or anxiety. I mean, it has, if anything, a negative flavor. It's not like khayal, it's It's more slanted toward the negative. So we don't even have a verb in here anywhere. These are not even copulative where A equals B. We have A and B in the first line, C and D in the next line. Um, what are we saying here? Are we saying these two are the same thing? Are we saying when I watch you comb your hair, I get full of anxiety and concern? Um, if so, why? Is it because I'm worried that you're combing it for the sake of somebody else? Or because I realize you're so un inaccessible, all you're interested in your curls, you have no interest in me? Um, is it because combing your hair is, is to you what having long dark thoughts is, is to me? Um, namely, it's completely natural and your proper role to comb your long dark curls, and it's for me, it's completely natural to be anxious. Um, is it that, is it that um, <coughs> the two things are in some way dependent on each other? Um, when you see me have far away thoughts, you start combing your hair instead. When I see you combing your hair, I start brooding instead. Um, you know, you can put them together in many, many ways, and the lines just sit there and invite you to think about them. This is a very simple case, but there are also um, more elaborate ones. But let me give you one more simple one. I love it. This is very famous, too. Koi virani si virani hai. There's the first misra. Koi virani si virani hai. It is a wilderness that is a wilderness. It's a desolation that is a desolation, right? In, idiomatically, right? 
boy, that's a desolation that is a desolation, is one, <laughs> one reading. Um, what's the second mystery? Anybody know? <laughs> Having seen the desert, I remembered my house. So, what are the possible readings there? Well, my house is a desolation that really is a desolation. When I saw this so-called desert, I said, oh, this is worthless. I might as well go home. My house is much more desolate than this. <laughs> <laughs> that's, one, that's one possibility. Another possibility is that this is, this is a desolation. This desert, this is nothing. This is no more desolate than my house. Is there any place that's really desolate? Koi virani, si virani. Where can I find some place that's desolate enough to match my, my own feelings and my own longings? When I see this desert, it's, it's like a house. I mean, who, who wants it? So there's, there's possible readings here of putting this together. Um, you could be talking about the desert. You could be talking about the house. You could be saying both are equally desolate. Or you could be saying both are inadequate. Neither of them is desolate enough. And it's completely up to you how you put the lines together. You get no help from the verse. So Ghalib, in that way, is giving you, um, like, um, instead of two lines of a poem, he's giving you, what, four or six or, or more. Um, there are just a, a great many possibilities here that, um, that can be activated. Here is one of the more complicated A-B verses. I want to give you one more just to show you the possibilities here and give you the sense of how clearly he's doing this on purpose. Gila hai shok ko dil mein bhi tangiye ja ka. Gila hai shok ko dil mein bhi tangiye ja ka. Ardor has a complaint, even in the heart, about narrowness of space. That's the first line. Gila hai shok ko dil mein bhi tangiye ja ka. Guhar mein mahvua is tarab darya ka. In a pearl was comprised the restlessness of the ocean. Now, do those two lines describe the same situation, or similar situations, or very different situations? In other words, is the, the spaciousness of the heart with regard to shock, is it comparable to what it is to, compare, to comprise the whole ocean in a pearl, or is it different? Is it easier to comprise the whole ocean in a pearl than to comprise um, the space for shock in the heart? Uh, because you notice the first line describes a complaint as though something unsatisfactory has happened, and yet the second line asserts that guharme mahavhua is tarab daryaka. So is that again describing the same situation as in the first line, or is it juxtaposing a completely different situation? There's absolutely no way you have to, it's a do-it-yourself, it's some assembly required. You know, like you get a package and you, you realize, oh, here are all the parts, I have to put it together. Ghalib has an astonishing number of verses in which this is the case. And I want to give you just a couple more and then I will, I will stop. Um, his biggest tool in this department is the wonderful word kya. You cannot do anything in them influence your reading. <laughs> if Ghalib were alive, he would be even more angry at them. They are so misunderstanding, they think, oh, undoubtedly the, the verse is confusing. People would be much better off if they could see. I'll just put a little question mark there to show them that it's really a question. Or I'll put quotation marks to show them that this is spoken by somebody. Or I'll put a comma in here. Or I'll put an exclamation point. And of course, in many cases, the whole point is you can't, you have to decide for yourself yourself, the intonation and the, the um, mood and the quality with which the verses are, are read and the lines are hooked together and given rubbed and made marbut, that in extremely important quality of, of being intimately bound together that the classical ghazal valued so greatly. So here's a little easy example of the kya. I'm going to give you an easy one and I'm going to give you a more complicated one in which you can see the full range of what he's doing. This is a nice little one. Havasko hai nishate kar kya kya. Havas kamatlap. Havas, come on, you guys. Greed. Da desire, greed, lust. Specifically, it can be lust, but it can be desire in general. Havasko hai nishate kar kya kya. What pleasures of action would lust have or does lust have? 
that's the first mystery, right? And you're saying, hmm, under what circumstances? And you have to wait. <laughs> <laughs> you have to wait to find out. What's the second mystery? Naho marna tojine ka maza kya. What's one reading? Oh, if only we didn't have to die, how much we would enjoy living. Look at all the greedy and self-indulgent things we'd be able to do if our lives were longer and we didn't have to die. Naho marna tojine ka maza kya. It's just marna that bothers us. What's the other reading? Naho marna Death is the mother of beauty. If you were going to see sunsets forever, would you bother to look at a sunset? It's only the knowledge of finiteness that gives us the potential for desire and action and craving. Both of these readings, equally plausible. Can you tell which one is it? No, only the commentators can. They simply inform you what Ghalib means. But <laughs> Once I have poisoned your mind against them, they will never persuade you anymore. <laughs> because to assert that Ghalib means one thing, to help you by telling you, oh, he doesn't mean this, he means that. Um, it's just so amazing. But that's, that's the typical commentarial performance. OK, here is a very complicated <laughs> example of Ghalib operating on full power. I bet many of you, in fact, I'm not even going to do this particular. I'm going to mention one verse that probably many of you have studied. Nata kutso kudata. Kuch na hota to khuda hota Du boya mujko hone ne No hota mai to kya hota According to me that's the most complicated verse that I've ever wrote And I've explained it in detail on my commentary It's uh, Ghazal 32 verse 1 I'm not going to talk about that now But it's another good example of verses that you absolutely cannot find a single one way of reading. You have to have a sort of penumbra of meanings and you have to choose one every time you read the verse by choosing your tone of voice. Okay, here's, here's a complicated example of this kind of Mani Afarini using kya and using another word also. Makta me se lab se dil kya nishat ahang hai. Makta me se lab, the coming of the flood. Makta me se lab se dil kya nishat ahang. Joy harmony, having an ahang made of joy or characterized by joy. From the coming of the flood, the heart is kya nishat ahang. All right, right on the face of it, there are three ways to read that. Makta me se lab se dil kya nishat ahang hai. How happy the heart is when the flood comes, right? Uh, another way? Makta me se lab se dil kya nishat ahang hai. Tore hi nishat ahang ye? Kyo hota ye? Kya bakte ho? Nishat ahang nahi hai. What's the third way? Makta me se lab se dil kya nishat ahang hai ya nishat ahang nahi hai. Kya bata sakte hai nahi hai ki nahi? Yes or no question. So from the first misra there, you've got three distinct ways to read the line. You have no idea uh, which of them is going to suit the second misra. When you look at the second misra, what do you find? Khanae ashik magar saze sadai abta. The house of the lover, magar, is the instrument was the instrument of the voice of waters. Now, mugger is another word my Ustad always reminded me about. He said, always remember that mugger means, what does everybody think it means? But, what else does it mean? Shayad. Absolutely means two things. Check your Platt's dictionary, check your everything. Mugger means, <laughs> mugger means but, it also means perhaps. And right away, if you start making permutations, you can see that if you choose one from column A, you have three choices in the first line, two choices in the second line. As you mix and match them, the complexities get much greater because either reading in the second line goes with various readings in the first line. And I won't take the time to parse those out, but there are huge numbers of Ghalib's shares that um, work along these lines and are indecidable or do it yourself versus in this way. Um, you might want to ask if you are thinking about it or if you're in a critical mood. Everybody has to use kya all the time. 
Um, aren't you overreading? How do you know the poor man is doing all this stuff? Maybe he just wants to say, kya. But I'm arguing that they do. And not only do we have mugger, we have so many other little words, and I keep noticing more. For example, b. You, you have two distinct senses of b. You have ye b ha wo b he, where it just means and, right? It's kind of uninflected. You also have um, ye, uh, you also have the extreme. Wo b he, even that? Wo b i a he too came? You know, you'd never expect it. So the and it marks it as part of a series. Ye b ha wo b, et cetera. The b, even something happened. So it's not part of the series. It's a special limit case of its own. Right there, when you use the word B, you can then invoke two different possibilities rhetorically. Um, or, for example, peer. What's one common meaning of peer? Again. Again. again, what's another common meaning? Uh, then. Then or again. Big difference. How can you tell? You have to put it, I mean, there's about 10 more words that Ghalib uses very carefully at times to create multivalent effects in his guzzles. It's quite fascinating. But even when, <coughs> even when he doesn't seem to be using special techniques, he still does multivalence against all odds. And I want to give you, I'll close with a final example just to show you how perverse the man can be. <laughs> this is a very strange verse, and it's unique in its formal qualities, as you'll see when I recite it. Um, I'm not even sure I like the effects, but it's remarkable. John D. D. Hui Osi Ki T. John D. D. Hui Osi Ki T. That's the only first mystery in which, like, these hideous, complete rhyme effects happen. But you notice who gave what to whom. Kissy Ne, Kissy Ko John D. Di hui John was ki ki. So what's one obvious reading of it? Anybody want to venture? John di di hui was ki ti. I gave him back. It was his. Yeah, the beloved or somebody. Uh, the beloved. Wait, I wait. Which which were you proposing? I I gave him back. It was his to begin with. Exactly. Right. Okay, that's one reading. Um, I gave my life, say, for the beloved. And I don't get any credit because it was the beloved's life in the first place, and so I was doing no more than my duty. Or, God gave us life, and the given life belonged to him alone. What's another re two readings for the second mystery? I love this. What does everybody say when they're a commentator? Oh, it was not possible to do justice because the life I gave back only belonged to the one in the first place. So if somebody gives me something and I give it back, well, I'm hardly doing anything good. So I, I didn't even fulfill the huck that that person deserved. All I was able to do is return what they had lent me, and so I'm still somehow at a loss. I'm still at a disadvantage. What's the other reading? Why? They quote unquote gave me a life, but it was really all the time theirs. What is this thing, you know? They claim to, they, John D, D, who we will see, key, T. The person retained control of it all the time. I really didn't get the rights and the justice that I should have obtained. And if you don't think Ghalib will complain like this against God, I can give you many, many examples. To complain, <laughs> complain against the beloved, too. So you notice, here is a verse, here is a verse that does not use any of the kyas or kahans or any of the fancy techniques that I'm, that I'm discussing that so many verses do use, and yet it manages to be um, really splendidly, fascinatingly ambiguous in how you read it and how you put it together. So it, too, is a some assembly required verse. And there's such a lot of pleasure in them. There's a special category of them called Iham that's been known in the guzzle forever, of deliberately misleading the reader and then correcting the reader or the hearer. Um, there's a lot more to be said on this subject, but um, this is a huge category for Ghalib, huger, I think, than for uh, most classical guzzle poets. And there has been very little attempt to systematically break down how these meanings are created and how the um, operative operative parts of the of the line and the verse are made to work together but at least I think I've been making a beginning 
Um, you know it's harder to do this kind of ambiguity in English because for one thing we have capital letters, we have punctuation, and we change the order between a sentence and a question. Uh, the sky is blue. Is the sky blue? Um, that's an inconvenience in terms of Monte Offerini. But I'll just give you one example. If you want lots of examples of how this is done in English, read Empson, Seven Types of Ambiguity. That's a, ma a marvelous book. If you would enjoy all of you will enjoy that book. But there's a lovely, a lovely um, final line by Yeats from a poem called Among School Children that's very famous. And it's such a beautiful example of this kind of multivalence. I thought I'd just end with it for, for pleasure. Um, he's talking about an oak tree and its, its um, sort of unifying power between nature and culture. And he ends with these two lines. O oh body swayed to music, O oh brightening glance, how can we know the dancer from the dance? And there are two beautiful meanings there. One of them is, how can we tell the dancer apart from the dance? How can we know A from B when the dancer and the dance are so put together? How can we know the dancer from the dance? And the other is, how can we know the dancer by means of the dance? If we see the dance, how can we thereby analyze or understand the dancer behind it? And this is a lovely, a lovely piece of poetry uh, that works on you in multiple ways. And this is exactly, I don't know if what I've been talking about from Ghalib came <laughs> through um, in my crude and hasty presentation, but it's this kind of beauty that he's very capable of, this kind of complexity. And that's why it's such a treat to work on him. And I get more pleasure out of my website, I assure you, than anybody else <laughs> in the world. <laughs> so I'm going to work on it for the rest of my life, and I'm going to work on mirrors also. So this is, I thank you for letting me go into all this. And let me stop now, and we'll have questions and comments.